Hi guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. Today I'm going to get back to the little mini milling machine that I've been building and address the knee component today. I took a break from the base itself because I realized that there's a lot of features on the knee that would be very handy to have as a gauge once I do the same mating feature on the base. So since the knee is the smaller component, that's the sequence of operations that I've decided on. It's a nasty little part. There's a lot of tapers, a lot of rounds, a lot of draft angles. And it's one of those scratch your head where do I start kind of pieces. So there's no better way than to just grab the part, scratch your head, figure out how we're going to hold it, and start throwing chips. Let's do it. All right, here's the part that we're going to be working on this morning. See, we got some parting line mismatch in the front. No big deal. That will be machined away. There are features on here that will not be addressed, and those are the features that should be jumping up and saying, hey, pay attention, because if you're not going to machine it, and there's a dimension giving from that area or that surface, well, then maybe that's a clue that that's not going to be machined, and that's where you start. If you take a look at these pieces, you can see how some of these pieces were in the mold, dictated by, look at this feature, see the wedge shape to it? That means it was sitting in the mold this way and sitting in the cavity this way so that when the slightest little bit of resistance came out it you know out it popped that draft angle right there on the on the core or the force or whatever they call these things is just for that purpose so the part will release and pop out easily but you know what i don't understand sometimes is if this is a sand casting and you're just going to bust the sand away from it to begin with at the end why put draft on it at all right make everything true to the world and just call it a day Maybe that's because this is where the material entered and they just needed a big port for it to flow. I don't know. If anybody does know, put it in the comments. So, looking at this part, there is really no dimension on the width of this part anywhere on this print. So this ugly right here, we're just going to beat that down with a file and smooth it out and blend it out. This little, this little growth right there, I don't know what that is, but I would assume that the cavity collapsed and nobody caught it going through QC. But that's going to be the second thing I address. The first thing I address is going to be I'm going to knock this gate off of here, establish a flat surface on a sander. I'm not going to go overboard and mill that just yet. Then I'm going to pinch it in a couple of vices so that I can roll this around and orient it correctly to knock that down. I'll look on the print see if I can get away with a through cut here. It's very possible that I can. And so be that. Now, looking at the print as far as the where to start dimensions, this round feature right here on the bottom of the casting, the part will sit in here this way, and you're not going to touch this. This is not going to be machined. So there's a clue right there, right? Here comes a dimension, dimension coming from that surface, which is this round. So projected this way, we're going to look for a 500 dimension from this surface up to establish the top surface. That's a good place to start. If there's an overall given from that, well, that's where it comes from right there. If there are no, where's them little squiggle marks? Come on, baby. There it is, right there. That means finished, finished surface. So looking at this guy, now keep in mind on a, on a metric print or on an imperial print, rotation is always under to the next view. Okay, this way. We're slipping under. So that means when I get to here, I'm going to slip it this way and look straight down on it that way. So that's, and on a metric, it wouldn't be that way. On a metric, it would be over the top. Wow, like that. That's how you can figure out which way the port's oriented. You can see that there's no finishing marks on the top here. There is an asymmetrical call out here, 438. So this dovetail is not on center. That's going to get you a lot of guys that do this. They're going to think, all right, I'm just going to go for it. This 462 on the one side from center line is so that you can put a gib in here and adjust that gib with these little elevations which are going to turn into screws. So that's going to effectively act like a little clamp and there's no reason for you to have any slop in this when you're done. Sounds simple, right? All right. Well, let's do exactly what I just said. Take a file to the outside, clean that up, clean this up, sand this off, press this in a vise against that surface using some type of device here and then just massage this until it looks like it's going to be flat and get that ugly out of there. Because that is just nasty. It looks like a beehive, right? I should paint that yellow and put little black dots all over this like a hive of wasps hiding on the side of your machine. 
There you go. All right. Over to the center. Once in a while, you'll see somebody working on a sander, and all of a sudden, the part just has to jump out of their hands and hit the floor. Old guys, FOGs, or uh, whatever you want to call us, would have to look up from our bench and say, what, did the part get heavy, or what? It's like, actually, no, it got really hot. So this part is, you can hold a really hot piece if you keep your fingers moving, but if you don't want to do that, take and dunk it or have something ready so you don't have to walk away. I'll be back. Now. <laughs> All right, now if your eyes are like my eyes, this side looks a little heavier than this side, but I don't know if that matters at this moment. I'm not going to let that bother me because I wanted the flat surface back here to work from to remove the beehive. So I'm going to run a file across this, make sure there is no high spot on it. And we'll go vice and vice and we'll make that go away. Let's do it. All right, let's take a look at the highlights of the setup before we start anything. Because of the draft angle on the bottom of this round feature right here, I'm using a little tombstone or a headstone-looking part that will register flat on the taper and register tangent on the top. So that is a good little push block to have in your arsenal if you don't have one. Get one. The double vice itself allows me... There you go, earthquake double vice itself allows me rotational control this way to bring this plane in true and since it is strapped to a secondary slave plate if I unloosen this nut right here I can rotate this part this way so I have full three axis control over this part or maybe that's four one two three who knows whatever anyway I am going to put a tool bit across these little screw nubs on the back like that because those are features that will not be machined i'm going to indicate the back of this so that i can you know put your visual reference back here i'm going to get it parallel to the world and then i'm going to take a couple of uh, dust cuts in there and see where i lie for the rest of the rotation and tweaking anyway let's do it i thought you'd like to see that that's a little headstone right there is a really good thing to have if you have irregular surfaces that need to match make one belt sander five minutes done Indicate it. Let's cut it. All right. After a very superficial cut, you can see that the corner here is a considerably deeper than the lead. So that would indicate that this part has to rotate this way so I can flatten that out a little bit better and that's why I decided not to just actually dust this initially that little wedge shape right there tells me all I need to know so hopefully I can get this vice to move the way I want it to move since I'm not on any type of fine adjustment and we'll come back and uh, see what happens this particular adjustment will be a matter of opening the main vice and rotating this base plate right here down. See if I get lucky. Okay, the material removal at this end right here is the draft on the part. I like the vertical wall that's been established. That feels pretty good. There's still a little bit of meat there. This will file out. And I'm going to knock this web out right here with a much smaller cutter to establish a square corner. 
This will be taken care of with a file. One more pass right here. I can still feel it. Now, some of you guys are probably saying, why don't you just rotate the part into the world? Well, I want this bottom true to the, true to the top. That's where I started. That's where I'd like to end up. But you know what? Since this is a non-working surface, why not? Let's go back to the original concept here. Unloosen this nut. Tweak this just a hair this way. And blend that out so that this is a parallel run out back there. That would be ideal. I'll file off to the top. Open this up with an 060 cutter right here. Cut it through. Blast it. You'll never know it was there. Okay, guys, I think you get the idea what's going to go on here. I'm going to take this all the way down to this level right here to knock this radius in this corner out and form a channel right there in the corner. Unfortunately, if I do it to one side, I'm going to have to do it to the other. So no big deal, but I'm not going to film it. It's going to take a little bit of a, a little bit of an effort to do that. I'm taking really small bites. I don't want the groove to be much wider than the cutter. A uh, deep cut will make a cutter that small flex. And I'll end up with a real ugly finish on one side. I don't want that to happen. Going to reset the tool to zero out on this face right here. That will be my zero face. And I'm just going to walk it back and forth about 7 million times. And I'll show you when I'm done. Be right back. All right, the machine work is complete to my satisfaction. I'm going to pop this out of here, put it on the bench. I'm going to file across some of the surfaces for a better blend. Take this radius and continue this radius down. Flatten out this area. Looks like there might be a small scallop right there from the reflection only. You can see that. And then we'll blast it and bring it back and show you. And the bees are going to be very unhappy when they return for dinner tonight because the hive is gone. See you in a minute. I spent about 10 minutes with some needle files cleaning up the track marks and the blends. And then took it over to the blaster and blasted it. Took the casting marks off the side here, the parting line. Did not finish this side. Sometimes you just got to clean it up, blast it, and they'll, the uglies will come back to the surface and you can see what you got to do. But, you know, as far as little setbacks like that is concerned, if you are really going to throw yourself into a project and want it to just be something you can be proud of, don't look at that as a, as a pain in the neck. Look at it as an opportunity to really make your mark, you know, just sign it with, with absolute perfection. There's still some casting deviations in the surface right there. I probably could have gone a little bit lower, but I didn't want to compromise any final dimension material up here. Anyhow, the beehive is gone. I think that's a win. Let's move on and start doing some other stuff. Squaring it up, making it look pretty. like it. Yes, I do. Next phase in the component is just to start establishing some surfaces I can work from. And I've elected to hold this part this way. That gives me full access to all four sides and the back surface here. And it establishes a perpendicular relationship between the back unmachined surface and the rest of the part. Now this doesn't mean that this is going to be the end-all, cure-all, ideal way to hold this. But i got to start somewhere, and this is what I've started with. I'm looking at the parallel nature of the underside of this particular casting to the top of the jaw, and I'm relatively pleased with it. When I do start the cutting, I expect to see some irregularity front to rear, but right to left, there's going to be a huge difference in the depth of cut here. And I'm okay with that as long as this boss down here stays true to the world. So when this cleans up, I'll stop cutting, I'll take my measurements, I'll look the piece over real good, and I'll know exactly where I'm at. Now for a part like this, we are just holding on a very little bit of material, well, a long run of a very little contact surface, let's put it that way. 
So I'm going to use a small cutter and I'm going to run back and forth with it because I don't want too much cutter on the part at any given time. And ideally, the whole face should be exposed so I may move the part up so I can mill the end face off as well. All right, let's get on the tripod, throw some chips. This operation forms a parallel and square top surface and then moves on to the sides after a bunch of passes across the top. By watching the Y-axis digital, I can assure that the feature that I'm creating right now is true to the raw casting sides that I'm currently clamping on. At this stage of the game, the part is oversized on the width. It is oversized on the thickness. I'm going to have to pick a spot on this boss down here where I want it to come into tolerance because it does have a draft downward. And I think that's the only way to keep this side here uh, looking the way I want it to look. Not yet to be seen. When I pull it out, put it on the bench, we'll know what I'm looking at. I'll have to cut the back side here. And then I'll have five beautiful, <laughs> nicely machined surfaces to continue the operations from. So let's move the cutter around the back side. Establish a section here where I can uh, flip this up and press it against the back jaw on a parallel against this side and bring this front end, do all the drilling, and feel more confident about the grip. This is a very delicate setup, and when you saw me put my finger on here, I was feeling for vibration of the part, which is a good indicator that the part is not secure or it's going to fly out and ruin your day. But if you do that, make sure that your appendages are well clear of the machine. I don't want to have any bad experiences. Okay, backside. For the depth of the backside cut, I don't want to go any deeper than the wall created from the relief cut when I removed the extra material from that corner right there. So this backside surface will not be cut deeper than that right there, initially. After some preliminary milling, this is what we got. Now this is just a chucking block right here. There's nothing is to dimension. This just allows me to have a parallel on any of these surfaces. Pressure, stand it this way, push it against the jaws this way, take heavy cuts, whatever. It's good to have surfaces you can trust. Squeezing on these small tangents on the side is just, you just gotta hold your breath while you're doing it. This is one of those give and take pieces as well that the draft on the, on the component is going to just let you scratch your head as square as this is now take a look at this i mean it's fairly square but it's always good to see it right i will go with the outside square relationship over any other feature at this point now that means that the 500 here is going to be out along the length of this bottom component right here. If I were to bring that in parallel, there would be a backdraft here. This would no longer be square because this is not a machine surface. So it's 50-50 dealer's choice. Roll the dice, whatever, throw a dart, you know, ask the cat and uh, come up with a course of action that you like. This is the course of action that I currently like. I'm happy with what I'm looking at and I'm going to continue on this course. So I'm going to put it back in the machine. I am going to bring some of the dimensions into the final width. As you saw before, when I had this set up, I tracked the jaws before the rough casting was cut. So I knew symmetrically which way to move my Y-axis digital when I cut the outside of the pieces. And I'm just going to go right back in there do the exact same thing. I could also put it back in the machine. This way, on a parallel, underneath, and machine these off conventionally. But for sake of doing the dovetail or any other features, it's nice to have both sides exposed at the same time. All right, back to the machine.
Now on the opening here, I stopped the center cut from leaving a step right here. And I'm just going to file this little ridge off right there. So for cosmetic purposes, that is right where I stopped the cut. Because the casting just wasn't in line with the cutter. I mean, it just didn't have the same agenda. It's not a matter of it not being set up correctly because it's a very symmetrical cut on either side. Cleaned up the ends. I will clean up the ends now with a file. This center, I'm going to remove some of the material out of the center at a later date. And we're just going to go from there. And you can see how helpful it is having surfaces you can trust. Let's clean that up, blast it, and take another look. All right, after about 30 seconds with a file, the ridge is gone, both sides. Very pleased with the way that came out. Would have been nice to have a radius on the cutter. Would have given it a more of a cast look. I know I got one, but I would have had to go much deeper here to accommodate the radius on the cutter that I do have. The symmetry of the remaining material in the channel is looking pretty good. I'm very pleased with how much is left behind here. These little ridges were right there. So far, so good. Well, the machine surfaces, I'm going to try not to blast these machine surfaces until I absolutely have to. I just trust it more. And yes, there is a step right here. But I made sure that the step was wider than the thickness of the parallel I intend to sit this down on. So for those of you that are typing away saying, hey, you missed something, actually it didn't, uh, that will come off at a later date, and it's functional as is. <laughs> functional as is, functional as is, let's leave it at that. All right, let's keep doing it. For this operation, I made an aluminum nest that locates on the large flat surface between the elevated areas in the back of the casting. This back surface will be established with a fly cutter, leaving a really nice finish and doing the entire surface at one shot. A casting will chip, so be gentle with it and grind your tool correctly.
long. Next set of features go in from this side and from this side. In order to hold the part for that operation, I made a nest. The small superficial groove on this side is as wide as the part, and the groove on top, the slot on top, is centered within the larger groove. So when you mill this out, mill this one out at the same time. What does that do for you, you may ask? Well, because that feature is going to be so hard to get a hold of, or indicate, or put an edge finder on, when this thing is in the vise this way, holding the part, you can sweep that slot right there, left and right, on your x-axis, and come up with your zero position for your part. If you leave your part protrude a little bit from the top, you can use a conventional edge finder to find the back side and locate all the dimensions. I'm going to use a parallel and a stop here so I can drive the part in there, flip it, take it out repeatedly, flip it over. There you go. Everything is wonderful. So one quick setup and away you go. This block should come in very handy. And that central secondary slot is probably something you've seen me do several times if you're a subscriber to this channel. If not, hit the subscribe button and get catch up. All right, let's get over to the mill, set this up, tram it in, make some more chips. This particular dovetail feature, it is up to the discretion of the person building this model whether or not they want a very smooth working fit or they want to go the extra mile and remove additional material from this side of that dovetail and use a brass gib driven by three adjustment screws as presented here on these cast features. So now that I know that the dovetail is adequate, I am going to take an additional to about a half a millimeter, 24 thousandths out of here to allow for that brass gib to be installed at a later date. Kills me to do this because I know this would be an awesome fit, but uh, let's do it just by the numbers. Next feature to go in will be this cutout right here, visible in that view, this view, all these views. So there you go, bump, rotate, rotate, rotate. That pocket, this pocket right here called out as 5 16 deep, is going to be kind of hard to do because this is a tapered surface right here. This is a draft surface, so it's not 500. Design intent, 500 here, 5 16 deep. The remaining material on here is 188. So regardless of how bad this surface is tapered, we're looking for a 188 finished thickness on the bottom of that feature. Now you may or may not be able to put a micrometer in there to do that, but I'm going to do this on the same little fixture that I built for doing the dovetail or for doing this dovetail. Yeah, I'm just going to lay it down at 90 degrees and pinch it this way gently and pocket that out. I'm going to set the tool 
from this surface up. So as this part sits in the fixture this way, I will register the tool off of this surface down here and drop the table down to a 188. And I'll know that when my cutter is at that height that this pocket is going to be correctly milled out according to this 5 16 It'll probably be a little bit deeper towards the rear because of that angle, but that's how I'm going to do it. So let's go do it. Okay, see if you can follow along. I am looking for a final cross section of 188. I'm going to bring the tool down just above that locating surface and use a 5,000 shim to set this tool. I want that tool 5 thousandths above that registration surface. That little recess in that pocket is where my part is going to sit. Now if you go down to the dial, I've got my dial set on 83. So if it were to go to 88, which is plus 5, the tool would be on that surface. So when I rotate the dial counterclockwise and lower the table, to zero. There's 88 and there's five before 188 leaving me some wiggle room for my final cuts. The gripping strength of a Kurt vise can easily crush this part and distort any final features. If you are going to hold a part like this locating on finished faces or critical features like dovetails, hold it just enough to hold the part against the machining forces that will be applied. Don't overdo it or you will damage the part. All the end holes will be done in the same nest that I've been using for most of the other features. The slot in the back was indicated for the x-axis zero point and the edge finder was used on this face for the Y. I'm gonna drill and ream two holes, drill and tap two holes, and show you what it looks like when I'm done. Elevation and cross slide shaft holes are done. Away we go. The setup for the three 30 degree oblique holes is very straightforward using the same nest that I've been using all along for all the other features. Pinched in the vise, angle block sitting on the 60 degree side, visually aligned with the pin. Drill and tap. All right, at the conclusion of your effort, this is what you should have. This will be mounted on the machine vertically like this. This is where the, uh, well, the table and the apron or cross slide will sit up here. This is the knee of the machine that will ride up and down on the front of the base. Now that I have a dovetail with a gib, and the gib is just a piece of O20 thick brass, about a half a millimeter, I have a functional gauge for the male dovetail feature I'll cut on the base. So sequence of operations here will work out pretty good. This is a very manageable little part. Careful when you drill and tap your gib adjustment screws in the side. Don't let them run through and hit this surface right here. You don't want to ding that up. That is a very clean surface at this time. And that's the way you want to keep it. The fixture that I made to hold this and mill this out worked out really well. All the holes are right on the same center line and if they weren't they would probably bind up and be a real problem anyway this was a very busy little casting a lot going on here the hole you can see is just a little bit off center to the round feature you want to see how easy that is to fix there it is now it's perfect <laughs> anyway the only oops on this entire part is that little dimple right there in the center you can see it I almost drilled the second 125 hole at that location and my little internal alarm just went, whoa, 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 don't do it. So I will probably fly cut that off and deny it ever happened, but that's yet to be seen. Modification that I will make, I'm going to remove 20 thousandths of an inch, half a millimeter from this surface here where the gears meet and this surface here where the gears meet. And I'm going to replace that material with a Teflon washer or a Delrin washer so that I can take that brass to aluminum face-to-face uh, -face rotational friction out of there. 
Not that it has to be, but it's my model, and if you've watched my channel for a while, you know I go the extra mile on stuff like that. I just don't like rotational faces hitting each other. It's the end of that part, guys. I appreciate you hanging in for this one. This was a uh, labor of love, this piece was. Let's look at the fixtures for a second. Fixture, probably the most useful fixture was this one right here. If you're going to make this part, you're probably going to need something like this. This was really handy to have. This guy right here. Mm -hmm. Male dovetail gauges. Male and female, 875 theoretical. But when they go together, it's uh, like it's invisible line. Love it. Little tombstone, headstone initially for clamping on the tapered surface here. That is no longer there. So sequence of operations, again, keep an eye on that. This part gets very fragile. And this nest right here, which was used for clamping it initially this way. Do appreciate you hanging in. Thank you very much. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well and happy and safe. All of the above. I am Joel Pye, Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas, and I'm out.